Hello, everybody. This is Angel Arts. I am so excited today because we have a very special guest. Uh, originally, I was planning on just having a friendly podcast with two of my colleagues about a game that we absolutely love and enjoy. Uh, but Roma uh, said that they were going to try to see if we could have somebody join us who actually is one of the main writers of Arcade Spirits. I believe both Arcade Spirits and Arcade Spirits the new challengers, yep. uh, Stefan Gagni. Stefan, yep. welcome. Um, super, super excited to have you here. Um, so I'll guess <clears throat> before we before we begin, I'll, I'll start by having all of us briefly introduce ourselves. So we'll share who we are, uh, what our pronouns are, where we're from, and if we were to pick a favorite character from the game, you can choose the first one and the second one, if you'd like, uh, and, and interpret favorite however you want. What would those characters be? So hi, my name is Hark, also known as Angel Arts. My pronouns are he, him. I'm from the Washington, D.C. area. And based on my YouTube playthroughs of the game, uh, definitely my first, my favorite character in the first game was Percy. And my favorite character from the second game was Loxley. I can go next. Um, so I'm Hannah. Um, I she her pronouns. Um, I'm in the UK, um, and in uh, the original uh, Arcade Spirits, I was all for Queen Bee. Um, I like a feisty gal. What can I say? Um, and uh, for uh, Arcade Spirits, the uh, new challenges, I ended up in a uh, polyamorous relationship with Grace and Jinx. Hey, and I'm I'm Roma. Uh, she her pronouns. Uh, I current I'm originally from the U.S., but I currently live in South Korea. And in my in uh, Arcade Spirits, my uh, my main romance is Naomi. And mm -hmm. in and in the New Challengers, I I kind of I kind of hop between the polyamorous romance between Grace and Jinx, and and the other another romance between uh, with uh, Rhapsody. All right, and I am Stefan Gagne. I am a reasonably okay writer. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I am from 1990s suburban hell, United States of America. And my favorite character is Iris because I just, I'm just fascinated by her weird little arc where, you know, she yes. doesn't want to be an AI singularity monster, but is kind of shoved in that position. I, yes, 100% agree with Iris. That's, that's, yes, thank you. That sounds super fitting. Okay, cool. Um, well, I want to start off by, as I like to tell people, I like to start off by getting to know the artist before we start talking about the art themselves. Uh, get to know them a little bit as people. Uh, so just as a brief introduction, Stefan has been a writer for quite some time. Uh, their internet moniker is Two Flower. Uh, they've, I've only just realized recently that uh, you were you helped write some of the modules for uh, Neverwinter Nights uh, back in 2002. Oh, yeah. I, I, Neverwinter Nights is one of my favorite games. So that was really cool to just see in your, in your uh, resume or repertoire, basically. Other works that you've done, Slayer's Trilogy, Sailor Nothing, the Penultima series, Unreal Estate, He X Coda, et cetera, et cetera. Th there's a lot <laughs> that you have under your belt. So um, I guess my first question to start things off, Stefan, is, what is it that um, got you into writing in the first place, uh, and then ultimately working with video games? I'm I'm curious yeah. about that. I was in elementary school. I loved reading books. I loved reading comedy. I loved reading sci-fi. I loved Douglas Adams. I loved Terry Pratchett, and it made sense. It, it just sort of made sense that since I love stories so much, I wanted to write stories. And so, even as a kid, I was like. I'm talking, this is back in the 80s. I am an old, old man. Um, in the 80s, I was writing like fan fiction for my toys. Back before I even knew what fan fiction was, I was writing fanfic, like multi-page fanfic for like my English class in elementary school. I'd like walk out of the computer lab with this dot matrix printer paper with the, with the holes down the sides doing like three or four page stories about barnyard commandos. And Amusingly, one of those early stories I wrote was um, for Sierra Online's uh, Hero Quest, later become Quest for Glory. And in my story I wrote, I wrote it as an online game. And this is before that was even a thing. 
like MMORPGs didn't exist and here I wrote about it. Like, I'm not gonna take credit for creating World of Warcraft, but like I kind of came up with the idea. Um <laughs> so yeah, I was I started writing fanfic very early. I continued, I wrote original fiction too, um, usually cyberpunk humor. Um Wrote more fanfic going into high school and college. Started writing more original fiction afterwards. I wrote several young adult novels. And I was just throwing this stuff up on the web for free. Like, this is before things like self-publishing or Kindle or Create Space were a glimmer in anyone's eye. I was just throwing it up on the web for free. And then, as you mentioned, yeah, I started getting interested in Neverwinter Nights module creation because I had made a couple video games that never got out of my local area bbs's back in the 90s for ms dos like we're talking like ages ago they were quasi visual novels in that i was trying to like mimic wing commander which had those cut scenes which were literally just you know head text head text head text um so it made sense like i want to try doing game creation again i'll get into this neverwinter nights thing and i made a ton of modules there and i burned out hard and i almost had a contract with bioware and it collapsed completely because wizards of the coast suck and yeah and then i went back to novels and finally i teamed up with anna to make arcade spare she wanted to do a collab project and i'd been wanting to do a visual novel for some time and that's where you bumped into my stuff <laughs> so you mentioned Anna and, and um, collaborating on this. Where where exactly did the whole idea of Arcade Spirits come from? How was that conceptualized? Well, I bumped into Anna at uh, PAX East. She was on a panel about uh, romance and games, which I was attending. So I, I like to attend any writing-focused panels I could while I was at PAX. And, you know, we started getting to know each other. We exchanged contact info. And we wanted to collaborate on projects. And a visual novel made sense because it's something that I was interested in. And I knew it was something within my skill set. Like I can write, I can sort of program. That's about the extent of it. But we can like hire someone to help with the art. And then Anna and I could tag up and do the writing. Um, and it's basically write what you know. Uh, we both wanted to do a romance game. At the time, I was really, really into these YouTube channels about restoration of old arcade hardware which is basically Naomi's entire storyline. Um, and I thought, well, like both of us love arcades and arcade culture. We're both retro gaming fans and competitive gaming fans. And it would make sense to just combine what we know to make a visual novel that's like informative and entertaining because we actually know a bit about the subject. And it just felt like the, the obvious combo, essentially. Like we knew it was going to be a niche of a niche of a niche because it's you know, Western visual novel, arcade focused, romance focused like this is a weird combo but it's what we wanted to make so we made it it's really interesting to hear the the thought process that you had with um with kind of like you you were both kind of like in love with the idea of arcades and you know you were competitive gamers like how or, or kind of like where did the the ai and like the sci-fi elements kind of like weave in to that at what point in the process did did that come into it I came into it pretty early from my end because what my favorite authors growing up were uh, Douglas Adams, William Gibson, and Terry Pratchett. And William Gibson did this amazing series of cyberpunk novels, like definitive works in the genre. And they were very focused on, you know, what would AI be like? You know, how would it be alien to human intelligence? How would it be similar to human intelligence? And I'd always liked the idea of a sympathetic AI character of one that was not the standard, you know, Skynet, Terminator, kill all the humans, take over the world thing. And since we needed a game mechanic, which essentially like guided you through this life path of yours and rated your personality and tracked your friendships, it made sense to marry the two concepts and like basically work with the modern concept of smartphone assistance and like wrap it all into one package. I'm curious about the timeline between like between starting to work in earnest uh, to, to, to start um, uh, brainstorming and start writing in earnest to the final product being released. Like what, how, how was the timeline for that process? Well, we got started in early 2017. Um, like I want to say January or February. The, the oldest file I have on my hard drive is February, but I'm pretty sure we were brainstorming prior to that. And the idea was we wanted to have each of the characters in the cast represent a different aspect of arcade culture. Each one had their own thing. Um, Naomi had the hardware restoration and retro. Percy had score chasing. 
Teo had dance games. Ashley had cosplay and the community. Queen Bee had competition. Gavin had the business side of things. So each of them presented a unique aspect so we could fully explore arcade culture and the concept of operating an arcade through these different points of view and these different characters. Um, we went back and forth on some of the characters. Um, some of them changed around. I don't remember some of the earliest drafts, but they were generally in the same shape starting out. Divided up the cast pretty evenly between myself and Anna in terms of like who would write for which character and just started assembling the story, like got an overall arc, had some ideas for episodes. It was structured a bit like a workplace sitcom from the eighties, like Night Court or Cheers or Wings or something like that. So originally it was way more episodic without a lot of overarching stuff, but it gradually came to shape as we were building it. Like, you know, kind of laying the train tracks in front of you as the train is in motion, which is not a great way to develop a game, but it was our first shot at this. Um, but it generally worked out. Like we didn't have any major overhauls to make to the entire concept mm -hmm. after we had already started. Like we kind of knew what we were generally aiming for. We just needed to find some interesting things to hit along the way. Yeah. You mentioned that you and Nana, um, you and Ann uh, divided up the characters amongst yourselves. So how, how did you divide that up? Uh, who wrote for who in the first game and the second game? Uh, in the first game, um, Anna wrote for Teo, Queen Bee, and Ashley. Those were all worlds that I didn't have a lot of experience in. I don't play dance games, I'm physically disabled. Um, I'm not that competitive, whereas Anna was a pro Smash player for a while. Um, and Ashley, Anna also does a lot of cosplay and loves like convention community building. So that was very much up her alley. Um, so we basically divided the cast in half. I, I took on the other three, she took on those three. We both wrote for the player character. There was a lot of back and forth editing. We used Google Docs to collaborate, which is weird for game code, but it works for a visual novel. There was a lot of back and forth editing to try to make the player character a bit more standardized between us and like not have them express opinions or extremely strongly held views that didn't make sense for what was written by the other person. Um, for the second game, um, Anna stepped back a bit, but did write uh, Rhapsody, uh, Valkyrie, and the, both versions of the rival character, because each rival is the friendly and the hostile rival are basically two completely separate story paths. There are some similarities, but they are considered basically different characters with different scenes. So in the end, basically the same amount of characters. Uh, yeah, so we, we tried to divide things up basically by character. Tim, at, at the point uh, that you just described where you and Anna teamed up and created, you know, the Sarcade um, visual novel, as we're talking, the last game that came out was um, Arcade Spirits New Challenges. When you were first working on the original game, did you have any idea that there would be a sequel or was that like as a result of the, the kind of response that you had when the first one came out? Yes and no. Like, we didn't start out planning, oh, we are going to make a trilogy. It will be like Lord of the Rings now. Um, but pretty far into the development process, we were like, I think there is another story to be told here. And we have a lot of downtime between when we finished up on Arcade Spirits and it was going to actually release. Because the, the wheels of the game industry turned slowly. They needed months to line everything up on the storefronts, to get the console port rolling, to do QA testing. And with all that downtime, I was like, I'm going to get started on drafting up some ideas for the sequel, you know, because we're probably, that's got to be the next thing. Like, like, we know we've getting good, good responses to Arcade Spirits early on, like good feedback. They love the demo. We had the demo up very early. And it's like, well, yeah, it just makes sense to keep going with this thing. Um, so the very first thing I did while I was on furlough because the federal government had shut down <clears throat> um, was I did the code for the Fist of Discomfort minigame because I want to say, can we do this ridiculous concept I have for a minigame? I want to make sure we can do that before I start planning an entire story around this thing. And yeah, I, I did the, the game logic and the AI of it and uh, got that prototype up and running. And then we were like, yeah, this is possible and just started working from there. Was there anything about the process that turned out to be like more, more challenging than you were expecting? I would say like, there is definitely like a scope creep factor. Like there were a bunch of locations that we had planned in the first game that ended up being not particularly important. Like I, there was originally going to be background art for Gavin's office 
And that was going to be like where Francine interviewed you for a job. And then as we kept going through the chapters, I realized we never actually go back to this room. Like that there's no reason to have a put to spend money on Gavin's office as an art piece if we're never going to be really doing anything there. Um, there were a couple other aspects. Like y- y- you plan for things early to be options that you can use later and then don't end up using them. Um, there is a pretty heavy spoiler for TNC I could drop here, if that's cool. <laughs> sure. One thing I will mention, this is going to be uh, full of spoilers, possibly, uh, discussion. So if you haven't played the game yet or are sensitive to spoilers, um, we're trying to make it so that we don't have to feel like we have to dance around certain things when we're asking these questions. So you are fairly warned. Okay. All right. I will hold up my finger just in case. Uh, to warn people that we are in spoiler territory. Okay, so the original ending for TNC called for, I believe there was going to be a lot more possession by Polybius, like manipulating you in real life. Um, And it was going to end with this massive, you know, hack off between you and Polybius. But remember the background of the destroyed stadium where everything's in ruins? And that that was actually how that was going to resolve. Like you wake up in the Polybius encounter and everything is wrecked. Oh, wow. Um, wow. Whoa. In the end, I was like, that is a bit, ex-. like we commissioned the artwork for it and everything. And then I realized in the end, that's going to really make it hard to resolve anything because we have a cataclysm on our hands and that has to take priority. Um, so I switched that to be the fake out end, to be the apocalypse fake out. So I was able to reuse the art asset. Yeah. And also we felt like I tried to base the world on the concept that there is maybe one or two magic hand wavy, there is no way to explain this, but it is a thing, elements. And everything else has to rationally derive from that. So in this case, the two magic elements were that the video game crash didn't happen, despite the fact that capitalism and greed would have made it happen anyway. Like there, there is no conceivable reason why they shouldn't have, that, why they should have held back the ET game and that all these other third-party publishers shouldn't have flooded the Atari 2600 in the arcades with trash, just causing the, the oversaturation. That would have just happened. There's no reason not for that to happen, but we're going to magically say that didn't happen. And the other element is Polybius, from which Iris is derived mm-hmm. in some way. So everything derives out of those two magical elements. But I felt that that plus the idea of Polybius literally puppeting people and walking in their skin was a bit too far. That's like really into the sci-fi nonsense territory. So I dialed it back. There is literally no, there's no possession. There's no puppeting. It's just Polybius being a metaphor for your own internal negative thoughts, for your own disruptive thoughts, for for your own internal depression and self-doubt and anxiety. Um, It ramps those up, but it is not literally puppeting you at any point. So all of that like cataclysm and Polybius literally having like people he's walking around in, that got thrown out, but we still had the art. So we like found a way to use the asset. So yeah, there, there are a lot of things that change between the start and the stop. And you still like have to take into account that this is a game and production requires assets. <laughs> All right, I'm going to put the thing down. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that absolutely makes sense. What you were saying about Polybius being kind of a, a manifestation of your own internal thoughts. Cause I think if, you know, if I'm remembering correctly, in both games, you encounter have an encounter with Polybius, and the only real attack that uh, Polybius has is um, your own attacking your own self worth or your own. You know, it, it it's he, he's repre- it it is representing your own personal demons. So that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Yeah, it, it needles your insecurities. It digs into you. It mm-hmm. tries to find out what makes you scared and what makes you worried and tries to pull down your self-esteem so that it can basically devour you at that point. Um, And it's fun doing psychological horror, even like a silly arcade romance game, because it's so out of left field. People aren't expecting it. They aren't expecting, wait a minute, there's like, this is telling some very relatable and unpleasant things about myself in the middle of an arcade game. What is this? And I love that. (laughs) Absolutely. Um, Actually, that links into something I was, um, I've been absolutely dying to ask you about because, um, so I, I was in a a bad place when I played the first game um, of the Arcade Spirits. I was unemployed. I was having a lot of self-worth issues and I played the, the, the first game and I was like, how does this game get me? (laughs) 
everything I was going through. Like, um, and and that was honestly like one of the the signs that this was going to be a game that I was going to grow to to love because um, it both games do that really well. They um, they kind of put into words what. Uh, the protagonist and people in their situations might be feeling um and i just i guess i wanted to know like i mean in the first game it's kind of depending on how the 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 person playing it plays it it can be depression it can be just kind of like a bitterness or a disappointment in kind of how your life's turned out and in the second game it's kind of your self-worth and how that's inherently linked to winning like what was the process what were the considerations behind those kind of very real, um, very raw emotions that you put into the game? Yeah. For the first one, I think it's kind of universally relatable because this is, this is a common problem across society is the idea of economic desperation, of feeling like you haven't really made anything for yourself, of that you've always been behind the eight ball, that like there isn't really any point in striving because you know it's not going to work. Um, and just needling into depression and anxiety in that regard. Um, so it's very, 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 very common for folks to come back to us and say, hey, you know, I was really able to relate to this character because I've also gone through some crap. Um, so it's like a lot of arcade spirits is, let's say, yeah, I'll just come and say it. it's a very anti-capitalist. It's that it's like pointing out the flaws in the system and saying, here is where it is breaking down and leaving people in the dirt. And that links in like this, the, the main character assumes, oh, I'm under a family curse when really it's just like bad, just, just society is screwing you over left, right and center. And it's more common than the character thinks. And they have to come to terms with what they've gone through. Um, for the second game, we couldn't just repeat that. Like that was actually a concern of mine. I was like, man, everybody was like, so they say, OMG, you know, the, the arcade spirits, one protagonist is so relatable. I'm like, I can't just make another depressed, anxious protagonist who doesn't know what to do with their life, you know, another 20 something trying to find direction. That's, it's tedious if you have to walk through the same emotional arc. Since the second game was built around this competition, I tried to think, well, what if, what is a situation in which Iris's push for you to reach for your dreams, which was the big theme in the first one, was take the risk and reach for your dreams. What is a situation in which that's not the thing to do? What's the situation when that's a mistake is that when the dream is toxic, when the dream is not actually what you need, the dream is what you think you need. So throughout our conspiracy new challengers, the player is pushing saying, I need to be a winner. I need to be a champion. I need to be successful. I need to make, make my mark. And that's not actually what they need. That's just what they think they need. Mm -hmm. So it was a way to do a similar idea, this idea of self-worth, and anxiety and worry for the future, but mask it behind insecurities that are projected outward and give the player like their own internal things to overcome. I was really worried that a lot of people would not relate to the protagonist in the second game because they have this drive. In the first game, you're, I don't want to say a blank slate, but you're very close to it. You can project almost anything onto that character, whereas this one came in with a motivation. This one came in with goals. So if you're somebody who just immediately says, well, that's not me, I can't relate to that, then you're not going to connect. And I was worried, like, oh, man, is, is anybody even going to like this game if the protagonist has this one fixation? But they folks were willing to ride it out, and I think in the end it worked. Um, I think w one of the reasons that it, it works is that it's a situation that isn't necessarily just linked to you know, the esports, the championships. Um, in in my case, again, I was unemployed uh, when I played the the second game. And I had very similar conversations with my husband about, you know, he was trying to tell me, you don't need to have a job to to, to feel good about yourself. You don't need to necessarily be working a job to have, have purpose. And so that was the message that I got when I played the second game. To in me in my situation, um, it was, you know, a job was like the trophy. It was like the championship. And that was yeah. winning was that was how I was getting worth. And I needed to take a step back and look at my own kind of self-esteem away from that. So I think that's the reason that it probably or at least one of the reasons I think that it took off because somebody can insert 
whatever meaning it has to them. It doesn't necessarily have to be winning a, a game or a championship. Yeah. It's a stand um, in for any toxic dream, really. It's a stand in for any win condition you've imposed on yourself, which doesn't actually give you happiness. It just feels like something that you are obliged to do because this is what you have been told must be done. And the work ethic in this country, which basically says that if you are not being productive, if you are not perpetually being productive, this is the kind of thing that results in side hustles, is that you have no value to society, that you should be ashamed of yourself if you are not perpetually producing and perpetually succeeding. Infinite growth, corporations reaching for all the money, not just some of the money. These things all tie together to create these toxic dreams. Mm -hmm. Everything that you all are saying resonates with me a lot, but not necessarily because of that, you know, the corporate like American societal thing. It's more of an Asian thing. So I, I, I come, I'm a Filipino and my parents are very much like, you need to get all A's, you need to, you know, do X, Y, and Z to succeed. And there's a lot of pressure there in Asian culture to just win all the time. Um, and so I love I love hearing about this because like, yeah, I can relate to this, in, in, but in a totally different way, uh, which yeah. I think is very cool. Yeah, like I, I grew up with a I grew up with a Korean mother. <laughs> and so I also had the all the pressure and, and and it did lead, especially when I went to college. I, I remember it. It did lead to to a kind of a I, I don't want to call it a crisis of faith necessarily, but like, you know, just the just um this feeling of, of, you know, what am I doing? Every, everything I thought I was supposed to do, I don't want to do. So what does this mean for me as a person? What does this mean for me as, as an adult? Will I be able to, to make anything of myself? And so I think that's another, that was, that was something that I definitely related to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in the, second the, game. the concept of a toxic dream is universal. It, it comes in right. many forms across many cultures, across many backgrounds. The idea of outside standards and goals being imposed upon you, which don't actually click with what you need to be happy in life. And I think that that makes it relatable, even though I was initially worried, oh, you know, who, unless you're specifically a competitive video gamer, you won't be able to relate to this character. But fortunately, it is more universal than I, I was worried it was going to be, is that this is something everybody's gone through. This idea that, like, you are told one thing about what you must be and what you should be and what being this person would mean to everyone else. And really it's a sham. Yeah. I did, I did want to ask you about um, the second game. I, I mean, the, the first game can go into some pretty dark places, but I felt like the second game definitely went into a very dark place with, uh, with the character of Coda yeah. and what, yeah, what happens with him. So I'm, I was curious when, when you were, when you were, uh, brainstorming this this idea uh like what what approaches did you what like how did you uh, decide to approach this in a way that would be sensitive but also still you know impactful yeah um the moment with coda i felt was very important for the protagonist's story to show them like the shock value of this is where you could end up if you allow the toxicity to come, come consume you if you allow this crushing need to succeed happen because if, if you don't succeed what happens do you just end end your path you decide well i failed goodbye um so it was kind of important in that sense that like it gave it gave an indirect wake up moment um and we tried to handle the actual moment itself as sensitively as possible i don't think we succeeded entirely i mean there's a lot of people who feel that it was a little bit insensitive towards Coda. And I kind of agree we could have handled that better. But um, we just, we tried to, went through a couple of different vision passes on that. We ran it by our pre-readers, beta testers, however you want to phrase it, and just tried to aim for something which had the impact we were looking for, the wham moment, so to speak, where you realize that things have changed and you now have something new to contend with in terms of how you emotionally react to the world. Um, while also not being like too graphic or too unpleasant about it. That's why it large, it happens pretty much off screen. He just steps off screen. We cut the black. There's a sound effect, but that's basically it. We don't describe any gory detail or anything like that. This is not meant to be spectacle. Mm -hmm. This is not meant to be exploitative. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if we entirely succeeded, but we gave it a shot. And it, we felt it was important to give it a shot to talk about issues like these. 
And that's also why immediately afterwards, we don't go with the chipper, you finished the level uh, dialogue from Iris. She's like a little bit stunned herself and just going through the motions of tallying up your score and checking your personality before she gives you like the suicide hotline in case that moment was too much and you need it. And on top of that, we tried to make sure we had an extensive uh, content warning that people can read. I like that it's 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 mentioned at the outset of the game, and we at, we patched in another mention of it right before that chapter, just in case you missed it the first time, which links to our website, which has both spoiler and non-spoiler versions of it. So you can pick your level of comfort and your level of need, and there is no judgment. It's like, if you need to know exactly what happens, we can provide that. If you just want to know generally what happens, we can provide that. If you're mm-hmm. pretty confident going into it that you're not going to get triggered by anything, that's fine too. Whatever works for you, you can play the game the way you need to. Mm-hmm. I definitely mm-hmm. got the impression um, that there was a significant amount of care for the player um, in that scene, um, at, you know, and at before and indeed after it as well. But, um, you know, I did see a little bit of... Um, a little bit of a conversation uh, that happened. Uh, I don't know if it, you are on the Twitter or if it, it, that's Anna, but I did see somebody, uh, people broached the topic of kind of how it was handled and then that you patched in, like you said, uh, another warning. Um, yeah. And so that, that to me, I think spoke really well um, for, for you guys because you, you listened to your community um, and you made sure that kind of people were as safe as they could be in that part. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I want to, commend you know yourself and Anna for kind of taking that on board because when you do have there there's unfortunately cases where um in in this kind of field where you can boot up a visual novel and be hit by a trigger with no knowledge that it was yeah. there um at all um and that obviously um you know you've taken care to preserve the safety for the player I yeah. think is yeah. commendable the content warning largely derived because I saw the the incident that happened around boyfriend dungeon where like people got smacked by this thing out of nowhere. And they're like, what, you know, it would have been nice if you told us ahead of time. It's like, I, I liked, I liked some of the responses were like, we're not demanding you take this out of the game, but we could use a freaking trigger warning. It's not that hard to put one together. I was like, yeah, it's not that hard to put two one together. And I put one together and I put it in the game yeah. and it is there as a tool for those that require. And we're going to be doing that moving forward with every game we make. We're going to do the exact same process. In fact, I've kind of improved on the website technology. You can like click to reveal the spoiler if you want to on an individual basis. Ha ha, I am, I am good at HTML. But um, yeah, it, it was important to us that like we make sure that we have content warnings in place. I... Hannah and Rome and I actually participated in a co-op Let's Play on my channel that also had trigger warnings. It was also a choice-based game that could have up to eight players making choices and majority ruled. And there was a scene very similar to Coda's that you could select to not skip over, but if you chose, you know, if you chose to, you would automatically be given the quote unquote best route like mm-hmm. around that sensitive material, which I thought was a really cool and interesting technique. And Roma, you are the one who mentioned this. What you loved about that was that even if one person out of the eight chose to try to bypass that trigger warning, then everyone bypassed it. There was just not majority vote, which I thought nice. was really cool. That's good so design. Like that. Yeah, very good mm. design. Um, There's a, I've actually done that in like the next unannounced game project I'm working on right now. Um, in the main story path, there are like two triggerable moments and you get the option to just skip over it and get a quick summary. Um, because it's like, this is the main path. This is the stuff you're not able to avoid by just not picking that part of the story. So I want to make sure that it's got like, not just the CW at the front, but like an extra layer of armor, just in case. And yeah, I think that's 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 going to help the folks that need it. And I want to be able to support folks. We are listening to feedback. We make adjustments. We don't always agree with every piece of feedback that comes in. I don't want to make a blanket statement like we will change the game however you want us to change it. But in ways that we can change it in reasonable ways, we are happy to step in and do that. Yeah, this is a great topic. I, um, I was going to ask um, more of a development question again, if you don't okay. mind. Sure. So during the development and or release of the game, uh, did anything happen that surprised you that you didn't expect? Um, 
I want to say the pizza bagel meme. <laughs> I, I want to say yes. like, the pizza yes, bagels, we, yes. we had a running joke about, you know, the 90s bagel bites commercial. When pizza's on a bagel, you can have pizza every time. But the thing is, in the first game, I wrote the pizza bagel as a metaphor for poverty. It's like, this is, this is trash food that is very bad for you, but it's cheap and it's quick and you can prepare it when you don't have a lot of time. Like it's, it's, it's premium mediocre food. If, if you've ever like Google the phrase premium mediocre, there's a really good blog post about it. So I was like, why are people latching onto the pizza bagel when it's meant to be like a negative thing that the player is trying to escape from? But it's, it's such a funny, it's a, such a funny line and a reference that like when we did the sequel, like, okay, I guess we're just going to continue the pizza bagel joke. And this time it's not a metaphor for poverty. It's just something Iris is freaking obsessed with. <laughs> okay, Spo spoiler alert, but I have to say this for anyone who's going to watch this and then go play uh, Arcade Spirit Challenges, because I did this this week. Um, when you're in that final yeah. fight with oh, yes. Polybius, yes, okay, confront Polybius and use the ultimate. Because yes. that is, I, I did that this week. That was the best thing ever. Because it's it's the ultimate expression where uh, Iris goes, uh, well, I don't want to split. So yeah, anyone that wants to go it. and do that, I, I, anyone who wants to go do that, go do that. But it is some of the funniest writing. I've, I, like, like, I will okay. reveal a little bit of the secret behind that, which is that okay. we had some extra time in the voice acting session with Iris. And the voice director in the sidebar chat we had going while we were recording the voice actors uh, said, hey, do you have anything else we can throw at this while we still have time, studio time? And we're booked for the entire hour. We got to fill it out. So I very, very, very quickly ran into the game script and I grabbed that scene and I threw it in chat. I said, do this. And it was so hard not to laugh while recording it. And when we were finished, we were like, we need to make a secret achievement for this. We need to reward players for finding this silly little moment in the game. And that's where the any time achievement comes from. Um, we don't normally do secret achievements. I like to signpost like what you need to do in order to find, get a particular achievement, but this was just too good to pass up. Mm -hmm. Glorious, glorious moment. Oh, that's amazing. A beautiful scene. Since, since we're on this topic, uh, my follow-up question was, can you share any other like humorous anecdotes that happened at any time while you were developing picking this game. This definitely sounds like one of them. Uh, okay, while we were recording the voice actor for Hamza, his final line in the game, if you went with him as the restaurateur in the first game, was, I'll have a talkie bag of those delicious jalapeno poppers for when I go, mm. I got it that took one. <laughs> five minutes to get through recording that line because he kept cracking up because oh, it's like no. this big dramatic farewell speech. And then he's talking about jalapeno poppers because yes. it's like, it's, it's, you know, the mundane downbeat punchline to the entire, you know, soaring emotional, awesome speech of Hamza. And then he was like, and I'll have a bag of dog. I'll have a bag of jalapeno poppers. Um, it took like five minutes to be able to say that line of straight face. Just everybody was cracking up. Me, the casting director, the actor. It was just nuts. Um, yeah, there were a lot of little moments like that during the recording where like something was just hitting so hard that it was like disrupting I love their it. actual work. I love and Hamza. It was so much fun. Actually, now that I think about it, some of the m most memorable characters um, are some of the ones that aren't even romanceable. Yes. You know, char characters like Hamza or Ben and ben Matt. And Matt. You know, they oh, yeah. Matt. Ben and Matt. And that voice actors. I was like, they are so good. The voice actors are Ben and Matt. Oh, love Ben them. and Matt are an interesting thing because they came about expressly at the request of a friend of mine. She said, I'd like you to write some older characters into the story. I was like, yeah that could work. You know, I, I have a place where like, there's this little side business that they visit in order to go talk about their feelings and discuss things outside of the work environment, which was this cafe next door. I was like, I can have them be the ones that run the place. You know, married gay couple, middle-aged, they're, they're older than they should obviously in TNC, which takes place five years later, but like present a little bit of, a little bit more diversity, which we're always looking to add into the game. And and the delightful thing about that was that I got to cast Graham Stark. I was a huge fan of Loading Ready Run. 
the, the content, con- I want to say content creation, but that's, that's such a silly buzzword. The <laughs> comedy troupe up in Canada that uh, I've been watching for years and years and years, they put on Desert Bus for Hope, which is this annual charity supporting child's play. Um, and I asked Jacob, I was like, can we get Graham in here to read for Ben or Matt? And like, you do the other one? Because you're both locally in the same city and it would make sense. And Graham was willing. And I was like, this is great. You know, I get to, I get to, you know, work with someone I've always admired. And like, they weren't sure who was going to be Ben and Matt until the day they started recording. They're like, which, which one, which one of these characters sounds better? Is it, you know, the one that's setting up the punchlines or the one that's delivering it? Um, and they figured it out. They figured that out on their own while they were busy doing the, uh, the tandem voice recording session. I, I, when um, I played the second one, I screamed so hard out of joy when I saw Ben and Matt for the first time. I was like, oh, let's go. Let's go. We got Ben and Matt in this game. I was so happy. Tears were like coming down my face. I was well, so excited. Structurally, it makes sense. It's like we wanted to have the sequel be standalone. That like you could actually play TNC without playing the first game and be a okay. And also there were so many different ways the story could have ended in the first one that we weren't just going to continue the protagonist story. The protagonist story is closed. The protagonist from AS1, Ari Cater, found their dream, realized there is no family curse, went through all the steps. There's nothing more to say. And even their romantic interest went through their own arc. So it's like, we're not just going to just bring back the cast from the first one, but we can bring back the supporting characters. We can bring back the secondary cast, the ones that helped you, yes. and they can then help the new protagonist with the I new love cast. That. Yes. Well, actually, I'm glad you put brought that up because there was one thing, one small thing that um, I was super impressed by. I maybe it was all in my head, but I maybe you can verify this for me. So. When I first played Arcade Spirits, I created a character that looked a lot like myself, and I kind of role-played as myself with my name. Then I went to TNC, and I did the exact same thing. I made him look exactly like myself, and then, because I had no idea at the time that I was related to the first character whatsoever. So I made it look exactly like myself, and I gave myself the exact same name. And then when the, and then when, and so what would happen is, when the when the reveal occurred and I actually met face to face, I want to say that the dialogue dia- dialogue actually said, "Hey, you and I look look alike. We're yes. practically twins." And I was like, "Did they realize? Are they able to see that the choices that I made with my appearance actually are the same or similar to oh. the old one?" Because I was like, "If that's it, I was impressed." If we didn't could, track the appearance, but we tracked the name. Got There's it. three variations. If the, name is, if the name is completely different, then the two characters are not related. If they share the uh, same last name, they are cousins. If they share uh, the same first and last names, oh. they are cousins, and they say, wow, there sure are a lot of first names in our family. Isn't that weird? I wouldn't yes. think too hard about that. <laughs> it's yes. like we put the lampshade right on there. Yeah, I thought that was brilliant because I... I, I would have liked to have think that you or the developers were going to anticipate, okay, some people are just going to put the exact same name and yeah. presumably X appearance. And I'm like, the fact that you at least like sort of thought about, well, what if they did the exact same first and last name? I was, I was like, that is brilliant. That was genius. That is yeah, at the, we, by we point needed, of like next level. <laughs> like, we needed an explanation for what would happen if somebody just had a name they always used. Right, it's like, exactly. Well, I guess they're related. And this is actually hinted at because there is one micro branch in a scene that almost nobody sees, which is if you go to talk to Ben and Matt in level two, and people tend to skip Ben and Matt there because they're, they're too busy building up their relationship with the other characters. They don't want to skip anyone. Um, but if you do the data import, Ben and Matt will say, hey, you know who this person reminds me of? Yes. Having first name, last name. I got and that. And if you do that and you do the same name, they'll say, oh, yeah, I know that person. That's my cousin. We, we kind of fell out of contact, but I know him. You saw yes, that? Yes, I right. got that. Because I, okay. I, I, I would never not talk to Ben and Matt. Oh, like, yeah, Ben and Matt. Ben and Matt, I would they're, never. They're a delight. Like, uh, so, no, I, as soon as they were mentioning the whole cousin thing, that was the first time I was like, huh, interesting. But I'm glad you 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 answered because I didn't even know that if you had the same last name that yeah. you were cousins versus if you had different last names. I was like, that is just genius. Two people, yeah. That whose idea was that? Your idea? That was mine. Uh, it, it just it's so just good. like I wanted to make sure that so we didn't good. have too much like throw you out of the narrative uh, dissonance. If like, wait a minute, wait, 
these characters have literally the same name. What, what's going on? You know, this this doesn't make any sense. So I was like, no, no, I need to actually like work this in and have them be related, or else it's gonna be bizarre. And if they have the same first name, last name, okay, we will hang the lampshade and say, isn't that strange? Yes. Kudos to you for anticipating that. Yeah, Thank you. Kudos brilliant. to you. Oh, so good. Well, I mean, the the most obvious one for me to ask is: is there a favorite route that you worked on? in oh, e- each or both games percy in the first game and domino in the second i like sad boys I-, I like people who are confronting like some terrible terrible stuff and trying to overcome it so yeah both of them <laughs> percy was my favorite in the first game i absolutely so so it's an ongoing joke on my channel that i have a soft spot for the gingers which I do in real life. Like my husband has told me, do you, do you want me to dye my hair red in a few times? So every single time I start a game, my viewers are like, oh, Park's going to pick that one. Like there's <laughs> Percy, there's the ginger. They need ginger to spotted. It, and the pro- it was a double, it was a double whammy for me because not only was he ginger, but, but the voice actor gave him, in my opinion, a very like attractive accent too. Whether it's accurate or not, I don't care. It was oh, that's not. Um, but I love we, it anyway. So. We we auditioned a number of different voices for Percy, including some who are legitimately British. And the thing here, though, is that Price, who is a good friend of Anna, mm. um, his audition nailed what I wanted, which was this the pathos of the character. It, it did the voice didn't sound particularly refined or elegant to like. BBC. It was just really like kind yeah. of this growly, low, you know, soft and quiet and whispering thing. And it was just perfect for what I was looking for from the character. Um, and what I really loved about Percy is that we have two storylines really going with Percy. We have the, the sad boy aspect, which is his family history and medical stuff. But there's also the score chaser aspect, which, as I said yeah. before, is like we're trying to depict different aspects of our gay culture. And the retro score chaser from documentaries like Man vs. Snake was the one that primarily was inspiring him, which was this documentary about someone who was trying to crack a one million point barrier on the game Nibbler. And I tried to breathe a lot of authenticity into his storyline in terms of how we intersected for arcade culture. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess to piggyback off of that then real quick is... Um, when you were selecting the voice actors for the different characters, um, can you share what specifically were you looking for, like in the in their performance for each character? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, we were trying to cast representatives. We wanted to make sure that the background for the character matches the background for the person. We wanted to make sure that we weren't, you know, whitewashing the cast. You know, there's a lot of crap like that going on in Hollywood. It sucks. So we wanted to cast representatively. And our casting director, Jacob Burgess, did a stellar job finding the perfect people for the perfect role. And then beyond that, it just came down to, do we feel like this character voice fits this character and has the range that it needs in order to hit the emotional highs and lows and the comedy moments and everything that this character is going to need to do? And... Jacob did a great job helping us narrow it down to the best possible candidates. I cannot, I cannot stress how amazingly professional and skilled that man is. Yeah, I can, I can actually remember, I can actually remember when someone, someone Cho, announced on Twitter that he was voicing Domino. Someone Cho, yeah. Someone Cho, yes. I was, I was very. Like, I, I actually follow him on YouTube and on Twitter, and so, and he already has a pretty big audience. So I imagine that was pretty good yeah. advertising for the game as well he was a dream get for the role it's like i didn't write it with him in mind but i was like oh man if we could get if we could get someone to do this role that would be amazing and he was willing and he really went out of his way to help us and to do this and he did just knocked it out of the park in those recording sessions when he had to like openly cry and break down as domino and then just snapped back after the take was done it was like oh my god this guy is just amazing well on piggybacking off of the voice casting thing can we talk about um mark mir as deco nami yeah. how did that come about yes. jacob man jacob burgess is a he's amazing what he does he secured mark mir for us which was nuts we weren't expecting that we didn't ask for that We're like you're gonna ask mark mir to do this is that even possible 
does that even work under the laws of physics? And apparently it did. We did get him to say, you know, my name is Dekonami and this is my favorite arcade on the Citadel. And we were eventually going to yes. use it in an, out, in an outtake reel, which I still should probably put together at some point. Uh, I even said, I think during my Let's Play, that I wanted Dekonami to say that. So yeah. I want to hear that. That's amazing. And Mark just hit the character immediately. He knew exactly who this person was and what level to take it to. Yeah. It, it took a while, but I eventually like realized who it was by like the second scene with Dekonami. And I was like, so in awe. I was so excited. Yeah, just amazing. When you're uh, conceiving of these characters and developing them, like do you, do you base them off of people that you know, or do you just go with whatever, uh, like however they lead you, basically? I base it off three things. Um, one, personal life experiences. Try to breathe aspects of yourself, not like a full self-insert, but take aspects of what your lived experiences are and work them in and you'll get better authenticity out of your characters. Uh, second, like I mentioned, we were trying to hit specific aspects of arcade culture. It's like, this person is going to represent this type of game, this type of gamer, this type of person within the overall culture. And then third, just like trying to get a really wide range of different characters, get the diversity in there, try to make a very appealingly wide spectrum of characters that there's always somebody that somebody will be into. Yeah. Yeah, that was um, that was actually something that um, while we were having a, a short break, uh, that was actually something me and uh, Roma were talking about in that, you know, what, I think one of the strengths um, of, of both games is that um, there's such a kind of like diversity there that, you know, there's... The, there's likely someone that will appeal to someone if you are looking to romance. Um, you know, that there, there's a huge range of kind of characters, of personalities, um, you know, even in, in kind of physical attributes. Like, I think the, it was a really good, uh, it was a really good kind of representative um, of different kind of characters. Yeah. Um, was, was that kind of like an active thing that was in the back of your mind as you were um, working on on the game uh, was was it kind of like we want to have someone that has this kind of personality or this kind of look or did that come more organically? Uh, both. I mean, we we from the get go, from the jump, we're like we're going to make a very diverse cast. Diversity mm -hmm. is important. We want to see more representation in games. I mean, mm -hmm. like the reason why Jinx is waving the disability representation flag in the guest hacking game is because, hello, that's me. I'm, I'm disabled. Um, mm -hmm. Different disability, but similar experiences. Um, mm -hmm. Diversity and representation are important and not emphasized enough by like big budget mm -hmm. major games. So we were like, let's just dive in and try to make as wide of a range as possible, as many different life experiences as possible. And we worked with sensitivity consultants from Salt and Sage to make sure we were doing this accurately, we we're doing this authentically and, and like with respect. Um, obviously, we can't say that we've lived every single experience that's in this mm -hmm. game. So we do research, we prepare, we talk to people, we try to get as much as we can, and then we do the best we can and let it fall where it may. But it was definitely a goal from the outset to have a very wide range. And even just speaking on a visual novel level, it's like when you're making a romantic visual novel, you want to have a wide range because you want to make sure there's one character that's going to stick with someone, personality-wise mm -hmm. or otherwise. It's like that's just good game development at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know I commented on this while I was Let's Playing the game, but I, I just really applaud how much I was able to learn while playing this game through those characters, like like just seeing that window and Jinx. Although, again, I absolutely love uh, Loxley because I ended up romancing him. But in terms of like the story, Jinx yeah. was definitely the one that I tended to gravitate towards too, just because there were just so many things that they taught me that I never was aware of. Like simply the fact that their apartment had to be like readjusted and there was a lot of ordeal just to be able to oh, yeah. be comfortable in your own living space. I was like, I never even thought about that. So I just really appreciate the type of exposure and just being able to understand those type of things. Cause as an LGBTQ person myself, you know, I've had to do the same thing to explain things to people. And they too are like, I never even thought about that or never realized mm -hmm. you had to deal with those kind of things. Oh, yeah. so, so thank you for that. And thank you for like sharing 
especially like that aspect of your world too, um, which I'm sure must have been a very like mm -hmm. personal experience. Absolutely. I put a lot of my own lived experiences with disability in there with Jinx. And I worked with an accessibility expert, uh, Kid Flowerstorm, who suggested serignomyelia as the condition because it would like duplicate some of the same challenges I'm facing while also being something that she could stand up and do. See, here's what, what helped me back from doing this Billy in the first game and is silly, but it's true is the text box, the horizontal strip that goes across the bottom of the screen blocks a wheelchair and wrecks the eye lines between characters. If they are sitting down. So I was like, well, how am I going to do a disabled character if the literal user interface of the game is going to fight me on this? So when it came time to the sequel, I went to Kit and I'm like, I want to make this happen. How do we do it? And she suggested a character that walks with a cane and therefore Syringa Myelia would be a good fit. So that way we have an upright character who is still visibly disabled. You know, it, the visibility is important. There are invisible disabilities. But I wanted to make sure I had a visible one on screen so we could really just go for it. And yeah, that, that was the, the key to unlocking it and making it work. And a lot of what she does in the story is almost educational in behalf of mm -hmm. like saying what kind of challenges disabled people fit. Now, if not every disabled person is the same. I don't have some of the mm -hmm. challenges during my Amaelia faces, a lot of them, honestly. But just getting something out there, because there's yeah. so little disability representation in games. I cannot yeah. think of any. Like the, the last major disability representation I can think of was in the 1980s in Transformers because Chip had a wheelchair. Mm. Yeah. Even retconned Batgirl using a wheelchair. Guys, jerks. I was, I liked that. I saw something of myself in that, but you had to put her back in the purple tights and have her kick people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I think for me as well, a good representation is that they're also not defined by it as well. There is so much more to Jinx as a character. I just find Jinx hot. Like, oh, yeah. like I think I love her style. Like, same. I, yeah, same. exactly. Love it. Yeah, same. Mm -hmm. And that's actually part of Jinx's storyline is that she doesn't want to be defined by this, but it keeps popping up. It's like no matter what she does, she keeps getting hit by these reminders and these needs, and she's not happy about it. But mm -hmm. she is certainly more than that. She's got her musical interests. She's got her overall attitude of being cool and hot, depending on the situation. Um, she's got more going on than just the disability. And that's also mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. Speaking of diversity, um, uh, so you, you included a polyamorous romance in this game, which I thought was very cool because um, I, I personally have never experienced that in a, in a video game. And I was just curious, like in the future, are there possibilities for something like something like um, uh, a character who's maybe on the asexual spectrum or something like yes. that, or other other variety, other uh, types of relationships? Yeah, we have an ace aro path in both games, but we don't have a right. specifically ace path or a specifically aro path. That is something I'm looking to correct for our next game. You can set ace and aro independently in that game. You can have a relationship that's largely based on sex, or you can have a relationship that's largely based on romance with no sex. Um, but it will, be, will be possible. And for the polyamorous storyline, this was something that was very, very strongly requested by our players after the first game. They're like, I would love to do a polyamorous route with characters. Not just like a harem ending, but genuine, authentic, sincere polyamory. And we're like, well, we could make that happen, not in the first game, but we could make that happen for the second. So we talked with friends of ours who are polyamorous and we tried to get like some, what are your lived experiences? What are your approaches? How would the, how could this work? And that's why it's a little bit of quantum mechanics because they don't have this if you're not specifically doing the poly route, but that's why Jinx and Grace are already poly and in a relationship when you approach them because that makes the most sense that they would invite you in rather than like you suggest it and suddenly they're polyamorous for reasons. Um, that feels weird. That feels awkward. That's not comfortable. But there is still a little bit of quantum to that, which is that if you are not specifically on the poly path, then they are not already in a relationship. It's like we, we, we retcon that in. I love um, that. It is like a bit of an ongoing debate and a perfectly good one in romance games is that should you lock down certain romances to certain genders 
Should you lock down certain romances to certain conditions? In reality, yes, that is how reality works, is that there are some people who are just not going to want to jump in your pants. There are not some people who are never going to be romantically interested in you. But in a video game, should you do that? Or is it a matter of player expression? Is it a matter of player freedom? Is it a matter of adding more diversity into games? You're not stuck with one particular romance just because it's the one that matches you. And there's an interesting ongoing debate about that. And I don't feel that there is one right answer. You're, you're preaching to the choir a little bit because this is something I struggle with too, with the Bioware games quite often, mm. because there is a running joke about, so I'm LGBTQ plus, I'm gay. And um, quite often what will end up happening is the characters that I really resonate with, that I connect with, happen to be the straight characters. Yeah. Like Alistair, for example, in the first game of Dragon Age or Colin in, in Dragon Age Inquisition. And so there was, of course, this ongoing joke, especially in the second Dragon Age, where like, everybody's bi, everybody's bi. And I was like, well, no, not necessarily. Like, I think if, if, if you're playing a game, your Meryl can be straight or bi or whatever, depending on your dialogue choices, depending on how you interact with them. So yeah. I, and I kind of like that approach in personally that you put in this game where if, if, the, if the player themselves are not comfortable with poly, then the poly content isn't really going to be like on the forefront or even, but if your play, character wants to develop a male to male, male to female, whatever relationship, there's the freedom to do that. And the other characters just kind of like form around the needs yeah. of the player, which is okay because they're not actually real people in real life. Like, I've, so, yeah. so it's different from reality. So that's why I'm like, yes, I get why people are like, this character is straight, be respectful to the character. They should be straight if they're straight. Like, well, they're not real. And like, this is all just a simulation. So yeah. you're not I mean, hurting anyone's feelings or yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I get the, the concerns about erasure. I get the concerns about, you know, like gay erasure, even straight erasure for that matter. But I feel the games are power fantasies. I feel the games are entertainment. And I feel that like removing restrictions is better. Otherwise you end up in a situation like cyberpunk where I literally read an article saying my boyfriend is terrible, but he's all that I've got because there is only one yes. gay romance available in that game. Yes. And that guy is a jerk. Yeah. I, ha cyberpunk. I don't want to get in that situation. I, I spoke, I talked for about 40, 45 minutes about cyberpunk because same thing, the male romance is there. I really felt very attached and thought we could work with this one character but he was straight and then the other character i was just not interested at all yeah. in that character and i'm like why why couldn't they just let it well, be available the weird thing is that the gay romance the character carrie he's canonically bi he mentions having a wife right. it's like you could have opened that one up at the very least but no right so I get both sides of this. I get that people want to see themselves represented and don't want the uh, their sexual orientation erased by player whim. But I also get that players want to play the game and connect with different characters. So it's like, I don't feel there's a right answer, but this is something that needs to be decided for a person by person basis. And me, I prefer to opt on the side of giving you more options. Because at the end of the day, people are playing these games, whether they're a dating sim, visual novel, or a Bioware game where they choose to engage in the romances. They're playing it because they want to build a connection between their character and someone else. So, yeah. you know, you're you're denying them one of the one of the facets of the elements of the games that they want to engage with. Like, for what? I mean, yeah, I, I completely agree with, with Hark. I think that, you know, if, if you're going to have romance development as a, a feature of your game where you you can engage with people um, and have romances and become attached to characters saying well you can have all that but if you're gay it's just this one guy <laughs> yeah um you you're, know, you're stuck with the guy who's supplying cargo in the cargo bay have fun <laughs> that's all you get <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, it. I mean, yeah, I, I, I get the reasoning behind wanting to lock it down, but me personally, I don't prefer to do that. And that's the philosophy I've adopted for Arcade Spirits, and that's the philosophy I'm adopting moving forward. Is that like, mm -hmm. just have all the characters be open and let the player decide what they like, what they like. Um, but I will say that um, with in terms of Arcade Spirits, I'll just use as an example um, a game, a playthrough that I did this week. Um, so I have noticed that even though, you know, the characters presented are all open to the player, 
the way that they handle relationships in both games actually is very, very different. I've played several routes in both games. Um, you know, for instance, you know, in, in the first game, you know, there's characters that are all in. And I remember I romanced Queen B the first oh, yeah. time. And she and she was like, I don't want anything serious. I don't like, I need to go at my own pace. Like, don't, you know, don't kind of expect me to make like this massive commitment to you straight away. Um, this week I played uh new challenges and I romance Zappa. And um when that relationship starts, she's like, I need commitment. I need I'm all in on this. Yeah. Like this is this is serious. I've done my one night stands. I don't want to do that anymore. Like I get if that's too much for you, but this is what I want. And I love that each character has their own kind of autonomy in what they're looking for in a relationship. Yeah, it's important to have different perspectives. So you have different characters, some who approach it carefully, shyly, some who just want to dive straight in, some mm -hmm. who are only looking for one aspect, some are only looking for another. It's important to get a good range. Mm -hmm. um, like even in the first game, like Gavin is surprisingly intense in his romance. Mm -hmm. And he says, I don't know any other way to be. I commit mm -hmm. myself to things. I, t I deal with things sincerely and I throw myself into them. And that is how it is. Um, and yeah, I like that a lot of people are expecting Zapper to be your, your casual fling girl, but no, yeah. she is, she's gutsy. That is her defining yeah. personality trait. And she wants to go whole hog. And like, this is my spoilers. You can get married to her. Right now. Yeah, no, I was I was saying this to Roma and Hart right before we had this interview. I was saying I did the Zappa route this week and I was so surprised because the way she comes across, you know, you do make certain assumptions that, you know, because yeah. she's very flirtatious, that she might just be looking for something more more physical. And then I romanced her and she's like, I want I want to commit. I want to be serious. And by the end of the game, like we're married. It's, yeah. Um, and it's it's fun writing characters like that who are just like all in you push the chips in the center of the table let's f and go and that is zapper in a nutshell and that means she is not looking for a you know eh, non-committal apathetic whatever we'll do the thing and then go on yeah but the other thing just about zappa is that um also a lot of her personality is informed by a backstory that she has as well. And yeah. I really liked that as well, because that is something that you only get from Zappa if you romance her. You find out that she has gone through something quite traumatic. Um, and I'm not going to spoil for people watching because you should right. do the route if you're listening. Uh, but, uh, um, but you know, sh that personality doesn't come out of nowhere. It's informed by her her life and the experiences that she's had. Yeah, and, and I'll uh, say, if you want to hint as to what that what's going on there, Look at her shirt. Oh, she is okay. literally wearing it right over her heart. Oh. So a fun side note about Zapper. Um, her thing where she, this is like a minor spoiler. Her date concerns sneaking out in the middle of their ride. Yeah. This is something that actually happened. I based a lot of the stuff that happens in Penguin Paradise based on actual stories of what went down in parks like Disney World. There was these two friends who would routinely get off the ride during Horizons at Epcot. They documented their experience. They would like go hang out backstage and have beers. They videotaped it. They had this whole process. And I even used some of their terminology for like making sure there's a gap, making sure there's like no visibility around a corner for how you got off the ride. Um, Videopolis is this dance club that was very TV focused. And that got translated over into the club that you go into in Peggy Paradise. The semi-secret, extremely exclusive restaurant you visit on the polyamory date, on Loxley's date. That's also based on a restaurant in the middle of, like a hidden restaurant in Main Street in Disney World. Like I breathe a lot of deep nerd stuff about arcades and theme parks and these games. And like, I don't expect people to get the reference, but I like that it has an echo in reality of something that actually happened or something that actually mm -hmm. is. Yeah. You know, regarding the romances, I also kind of, I also kind of liked that there was, uh, uh, when you romance the rival, I've only done the mm -hmm. friendly, I've only done the friendly rival romance. And um, I like one thing that surprised me about that one is that it gets pretty hot and heavy. <laughs> during yep, the day. That's, that's Anna. <laughs> um, I myself am Ace Arrow, so when I wrote or I wrote, write a romance, it tends to just be a very, very, very intense friendship. I'll admit that I'm like not very good at it. But Anna loves writing romances, and like 
when she was like wondering like how steamy to make the rival, I was like, dude, just go with your heart, do what you want. Um, Anna loves a good rivals to love her storyline. So just went hog wild on that. The, the rival romance is extraordinarily thirsty. <laughs> it's very thirsty. But at the same time, there was also that kind of, that emotional aspect of, of you know, uh, being, being together in that way. And then suddenly they walk away. And yeah. for reasons unknown, which, um, which uh, resonated with me a little bit <laughs> in a way that kind of brought, it, brought up some bad memories. But like, I, I, had never, I had never had a video game like make me feel that way, <laughs> which, yeah. which was, which was uh, very surprising to me, but in a good way that it, can, it could bring that, that level of emotion out of me. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we what we try to do with the relationships in both these games is that a lot of games they like they go, "I love you," you kiss, fireworks go off, the end. You never see anything mm-hmm. more of their story. It's just the mm-hmm. confession is the whole driving point. Once you start mm-hmm. the romance, the story ends. We don't do that. We show the conf- the relationship continuing past that point. Yeah. We show the down moments. We show the arguments. Mm-hmm. We show the trouble. We show the difficulties and we show the reunions and the happiness and the joy. Mm-hmm. So having the rival go through this momentary breakup with you for their own reasons adds to that drama and it adds to the realism that like relationships are not always just, I love you at the end. No, mm-hmm. there's, there's always more to it. You have to be adults and work through it. Yeah, um, that actually uh, reminds me of something I really loved about the first game, which was every route at in kind of like the la- later levels has a, a conflict. Yeah. And each conflict is different depending on the route that you're in. I was really surprised when I started doing kind of replays because I, I remember Queen B, you know, um, she said that I was coming on too strong and that I wasn't respecting her boundaries. And I thought, well... Like, that's that's really unique content to Queen Bee. I wonder what happens in other. So I did a couple of other routes, and the conflict is different each time. Each, and, and I love that you're doing that. That you're you're not kind of saying you kiss, you're together, the end. That the couples have to have their own issues to overcome. I think that's it, it adds a, a layer of realism um, to the relationship that just kind of builds that investment. Yeah, it, it was important to me that after we start the relationship, we show that humans need to work through conflict, that relationships mm-hmm. are not always easy. You have to work for them. And sometimes you will have con- you will have disagreements. And mm-hmm. so each one of those scenes is tailored to what are the conflicting hopes and dreams of these characters? What are their conflicting needs, their conflicting values? And as a result, you know, it's not just a one size fits all. It has to be tailored to the character. Yeah. And then we repeated that kind of in your challengers where after the break point, after the big down moment, um, your protagonist is going through crap and we flip proof, we flip perspectives to them trying to bring you back. Yeah. So it's like an inversion of it, but it's still the same basic idea, which is that relationships take work and you need mm-hmm. to communicate. Yeah. Um, and it's a compliment, I think, to to the writing there and, and the kind of thought process behind it, because I would imagine, uh, not to point at any particular visual novel or anything, but I would imagine that an approach that um, other developers might take is that, okay, we'll put in this conflict, but we will kind of have it kind of the same shape or flavor um, and just kind of like stick in the names different and all that. So yeah. it's, you're kind of having the same argument just with different characters. Um, so the fact that, you know, you you and Anna as, as kind of the writers decided, no, we want each one to be tailored to the character that you're romancing, I think it's a huge compliment to the writing. I think my favorite example of that is probably the, uh, the, the hair mending Valentine's Day in Persona 5, is when mm. all the girls mm-hmm. show up offering you chocolate. Now, if you literally romance all of them, you can nakedly see the template they stamped out for the dialogue for each character all in a row. You say, okay, this is where they're going to say a line that's similar to this. And then the next girl says the same line. The next girl says the Mm -hmm. same line. The next girl says the same line. And it's like that scene was not tailored to the situation you were actually in. It was just like, we're going to factory stamp out these conflicts. And granted that works for humor, but it's like, okay, I've just had the 10th girl say literally the same thing to me in a row. Aren't these girls noticing that they are repeating each other? Yeah. Yeah. You got to tailor stuff like that to the actual Mm -hmm. situation. 
And of course, in Persona 5, they didn't let me have my Ryuji romance. Yeah. Even though it was so blatant. They were so blatant. And they wouldn't let you have the disaster by with a catchy. (laughs) Yeah, a catch. I love the catchy too. (laughs) But Ah. um, go. Going back to the to the rival in um, TNC, uh, I I just want to commend Anne because I one of my worries I was pretty like confident though in both in both of you the writers, but I I had a slight worry of is this rival character that I'm creating, which I thought was a really cool new add to the second game. Um, how fleshed out are they going to be, uh, yeah. especially if we decide to romance them? And I. I wasn't sure if the character would be romanceable and I was hoping to be pleasantly like surprised. Uh, but I really, really was impressed that a, you get to have two different versions of the rival, the friendly or the unfriendly arrival. Um, and then when I found out we could romance them, I, I did end up uh, trying the romance route with the rival, the friendly rival as well. And uh, I was super, super pleased because I I 100% love both the intense friendship types of relationships and the thirsty, the thirsty yeah. friendships too. You know, I like both if I can have them. So I was also like Roma pleasantly surprised that it got really steamy there. I was like, ooh, like, yeah. I, this is great. I, I like this stuff. This is and so I cool. really took on probably the most challenging pair of characters in the game, which is the rival. Because again, characters customizable, Characters are following their own unique twin paths, which hit some of the same notes, but not really. And it took a lot of work. Uh, She was really just going at it, trying to make these two different storylines that had similar echoes. And it was just a huge task. I'm very proud of the work that she did on it. And the results speak for themselves. Yeah, the, the customizable rival thing, this was actually inspired by another game. It was one of the Max Gentleman games. I think Max Gentleman Sexy Business lets you make your own rival. I was like, that is such a cool idea. And we are doing this game about rivalry and competition. I think we should do that in hours. Um, the character creator, though, wow, that is a piece of work. Molly just bent over backwards. They did so much work to make all the individual pieces for that. Because unlike something like Dream Daddy, where the character creator is literally making just a static picture, It's unchanging. Nothing happens to it after you make it. Ours had facial expressions. Ours had body language. Ours had the same, exact same range of expressiveness as every other character in the game had. All the the same set of facial expressions, the same set of poses. And doing that with a customizable character, particularly a customizable character of different body types, is nuts. It ended up being like 350 PNG files all told, all being assembled and tinted in code on the fly. It was bonkers. So using that system to create the rival made sense. It's like, let's use the same power, just double it up and give you the ability to create the rival from scratch with the only exception being the shirt colors. We wanted to have them have play to wins signature dark gray. Um, but yeah, that, that was the thinking behind that, was that let's give them a different experience from the other characters, even though it's going to be a lot of work on behalf of Anna and Molly. I've noticed on the, on the subject of color, I've noticed that um, in uh, Arcade Spirit Suit Challenges, um, everybody kind of has their own color scheme. Yes. Like the, the room, so like Loxley is uh, is green. Uh, Jinx has got the the purple, and the characters that seem to be kind of designed to like match their colors. So I'm guessing that that was like a conscious decision. Um, Absolutely, having the first um, game too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I come from the oldest school of adventure games from the from the Lucas Arts games, Secret of Monkey Island, Sam and Max, uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple, and the Fate of Atlantis, things like that. And in those games floating over their heads would be the subtitle of what they're saying, if it is voice active, it's not, it's just text. But each character had their own unique color, their signature color, and it made it very easy to tell who was speaking. If someone's speaking Mm -hmm. red, this is this character. If they're speaking blue, it's this. At an instant glance, you know what it is. Mm -hmm. So I repeated that through with the text box at the bottom of the screen, so it's not just all white, you know, and you Mm -hmm. have to literally read the name tag to, to know. Um, Mm -hmm. If you're colorblind, the name tag is there, but this gives you an additional indicator. So carrying that through to the clothes also helps you immediately know, oh, this person is light blue. Domino is wearing light blue. There you go. Mm -hmm. And also those colors roughly correspond to their personality. 
because mm-hmm. we have the four indicators, the kindly, steady, gutsy, quirky, and those colors match up. Jinx is steady and gutsy. Red and blue make purple. Loxley is kindly green. Naomi is kindly green. Gavin is steady blue. And Teo is gutsy red. Things like that. Ashley is, I believe, quirky, steady. So blonde hair, blue shirt. Mm-hmm. It's not perfect. Like Grace is orange and there is nothing that maps up to orange, but it is generally the starting point we picked from. And then like when we needed color variations, like we can't have two people in red. It's like, it's going to get very confusing when they're on screen. That's when we would dig into like some of the other shades. Mm-hmm. Since we're, we're nearing, starting to near the end of, of our time, I wanted to definitely ask, uh, can you give us any teasers for a possible third game? Are you able to give us any teasers? Yes. I can't give you too much because we haven't officially announced yet, but I will say I am working on something. It is not Arcade Spirits. It is something new. It is going to have, it's going to be something interesting, something unique, something a bit different. It's still a visual novel. I'm not going to say it's not a visual novel. There's still romance elements. It's still player, you know, player sexual romance like we did for the previous games. As I mentioned, it will have independent a scenario. So you can have a relationship with one or the other or both. And I think it's going to be very different. And I'm taking a lot of risks and I'm a little nervous about it. But I am hoping that Arcade Spirits fans are going to enjoy it. And they should keep an eye on Twitter and on FictionFactoryGames.com and our Discord and all the various channels. If Daddy Elon destroys Twitter. We also have a Tumblr and a Mastodon, and arguably a hive, but it's so annoying to use. Um, <laughs> so keep an eye out because we're going to be announcing this soonish and awesome. hoping to release this year, but no promises. And I think you're going to enjoy it if you like comedy and satire and if you like the kind of writing that we do. And if you like crime. <laughs> This question is is tangentially related, so don't feel like you have to reveal anything that's specific to that okay. possible project. But I was just curious, just in general, like we were talking about, um, you know, things that uh, representation. So uh, for hypothetical future games, um, what other uh, what other types of characters representatively other than the ace arrow would you like to explore what other storylines or themes would you like to explore i'm just curious uh i mean we cover a really wide range already offhand i can't think of anything we haven't literally delved into but i'm sure there's something i'm not going to say we, we have we have done all the work we are we're sitting on a mountain yes everything is great no cool. um we're always improving and we're always looking into new ideas um, mm-hmm. but we are going to try to maintain like the work that brought us here. So, like we're going to maintain pronoun selections. We're going to maintain skin selections. We're going to maintain the ability to romance anyone. We're going to maintain non-binary representation. We're going to maintain, hopefully maintain poly. I need to figure out a way to work that into the next one because the, it's a different structure, but we are going to try to make sure that we are giving you what you've come to expect from us in terms of diversity and in yeah. terms of interesting new mm-hmm. life experiences and stories. One one thing I'll mention, and this is not necessarily like a request, but I just wanted to share that um, I I'm so happy about the Jinx and Grace like oh, yeah. poly relationship, and I have I have seen other games or stories that explore poly relationships, but it's almost always women all the time. Yeah, and because I feel like sometimes when you put when you write men male poly relationships, they're not always the most stable <laughs> and or you know what I'm saying and, yeah. and I'm like I don't know why that is because I like I, I just want to have a positive representation of a poly male relationship and yeah. I haven't seen that yet but I have seen it for women so I'm just throwing it out there just so you know no, I agree with you in fact like the one candidate I'm looking at for poly in the next game I think would end up being a man and a woman like a mix it up that's cool um, I don't know yet, though. Like I said, the next game has a very different structure, and trying to work that in is a lot harder than it was in Arcade Spirits, where we had like a very wide range of folks to like to pick two and run with it. Um, but yeah, that is certainly something that's on the radar. And then the other thing that I'll also mention that I haven't seen enough positive representation of, and I again mentioned this a lot in not your games, but other games, is that every single time there is a character that is 
religious or has mm. a very spiritual thing it's it's like they're the bad guy or they're yeah. the judgmental character or you're you know and it that that hurts me a lot because um I, I feel like I, as somebody who does identify with that, I'm not represented well. It's it's normally negatively in especially a lot of media or stories or games lately. So it'd be cool if there was some better representation of that in a future game. Yeah, the, the national narrative like tends to sideline those characters into either neutral or negative roles. And I agree with you. Um, it's something I might be working to the next game. I haven't fully decided. Um, there will certainly be a character who is not averse to religion at the very least. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. This is something that could be nice to see some more representation of a positive experience of someone who has faith. Oh, actually, wait a minute. Okay, this is not actually highlighted anywhere in the games, but you notice Matt is wearing a cross. Yes, I missed that. Yeah, yeah I missed well, that. Okay. I have a prequel novel, which is unfortunately on massive hiatus because okay. I got tangled up in writing the next game. But in that novel, there is an exploration of Matt's faith. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, so I would if, like I ever, if I ever finish that book, because I'm so stuck with doing the games, um, uh, that would definitely be something. And especially as somebody who is, who is, who is gay, because... Yeah, I'm constantly asked. So yeah, so you're religious, but you're also gay. How does that work? And I'm like, like yeah. I, I get tired of having to explain that to people all the time. It's like they're not mutually exclusive. <laughs> they're, and that, they're... that specific thing gets explored in the story. And I've been working with a good friend of mine who's very religious in order to try to present, you know, both the positives and the negatives of religion. Right. There's like another character is experiencing a very toxic family situation due to religion. But then right. you have Matt, who is doing well and is a good example of where it can all click. Um, I, I would that. like to finish that book someday. I've just been so distracted by these game projects. <laughs> yeah. But it will hit eventually. Mm -hmm. Is there anything uh, definitive at the moment in terms of the future of Arcade Spirits that you can reveal? Or is that still something that you and I Anna... Mean, I'll just... say that Arcade Spirits 3 isn't on the radar right now. Like, we haven't made okay. plans. We have a vague idea of what it could be if we decide to do it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to commit to saying we will absolutely do yeah. an arcade spirit. No, no um, absolutely. there's a lot of factors behind the scenes, but I will say mm -hmm. that I would not be averse to doing it. It's not in the cards right now, but I think there is a possibility in the future. Maybe it'll happen. Yeah. And uh, if someone, if someone was interested in getting into uh, creating, creating visual novels and getting into whether it's visual novels or just romance games in general, like what, what, what are some, pieces of advice that you would give them? Oh man, um, your engine selection is very important. What engine you use to do the game. A visual novel is nice because it's largely simple scripting. There isn't a lot of hard programming involved, but the thing is, is that the most popular visual novel engine out there right now, the one that we're using called RenPy, it's powerful, it's flexible, it's open source, it's great. It does not run on game consoles. That is the Achilles heel. It is extremely devoted to being open source software to the point where it will not run on closed platforms. So, and there's only one company on earth that has cracked the nut of trying to port a RenPy game to video game consoles, the Xbox, Switch, and PlayStation. So if you are just a hobbyist or if you are looking specifically for the PC market, RenPy is your pick. It is delightful. It is a great environment. I love it. If you want to go big, if you want to go wide, if you want to be on every platform that exists, you're going to want to get an engine that's based out of Unity or Game Maker or something else that has a very, very clear cut path to getting things on consoles. That's like, it's a foundational decision you have to make before you even think about characters or plot is how big do you want to go with this and what will your technical limitations be? Now, mm -hmm. Beyond that, it's like it's just down to being a strong writer, to working from the outside in, to outlining, to having a goal, to trying to say something, to trying to have a theme, and then trying to find the characters that will help you get that work, make that work. Stefan, what would you say is, what is it about the Arcade Spirits games that you personally are most proud of? I want to say the diversity, but honestly, just edging past that because I am a freaking nerd is the authenticity of arcade culture, is the deep-rooted love of 
authentically presented arcade culture of the hardware, of the games, of the people that played them, of the way the arcades were run, of the entire scene, of what could have been and what was in the 80s. Mm -hmm. It's like, for me, speaking on a deep geek level, that just tickles my funny bone. It's like nobody has approached that in a story to date. There'll be games that talk about arcades or involve arcades, but none that really go into the nitty gritty of how these things work. And I love our diverse game. I love the diversity of it. That is something I adore. But the fact that it is arcade focused is like something special to me because nobody else has done that. Mm -hmm. And I'm thrilled mm -hmm. with that. Um, and can you can you say anything about um, the future of if there were kind of if there was an arcade three or anything kind of still in that universe? Can you say anything about the future of Iris and all that that kind of the AI plotline or anything that might be kind of teased um, in that regards? Now I'm I not going to ask you to commit to anything, but okay, anything um, I will say one thing, which is that. One of the reasons why Arcade Spirits 3 is up in the air is because you got to address the Iris plotline. That's the elephant in the room. Yeah. This is the thing that's being built. And the more you dig into that, the more it stops being a game about friendship and romance in arcades and it starts being a cyberpunk science fiction epic with yeah. heavy sci-fi elements. It's like, does this really mesh? Like, it's good for spice and flavor in the previous two games, but do we want to make this deep lore the heart of a game? which you'd have to do because it, it needs resolution. Um, mm. Maybe it'll happen. Maybe it won't. I don't know. But the way it'll unfold will be something you'll have to find out. Yeah. I think it's a good answer. And I, I agree that, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of places it could go, but yeah. I definitely agree that, um, you know, obviously the heart of these games is, you know, the, uh, the friends we made along the way. Yeah. Yes. It, 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 I mean, cringe is just sincerity wearing a mask. It's good. Yeah. It's a good thing. And the friends yeah. we made along the way is not to be discounted. No, not at all. No. It's why we played the games at the end of the day. It's, you know, right. Yeah. Stefan, thank you so much for your time. I, I learned a lot, and I hope the viewers who are watching learned a lot. Um, and uh, whenever, if ever, you release another game, know that this is an open invitation for you and Anne, if either of you are interested in coming back again for us to chat about the new game. And I, of course, would be very supportive and would love to promote your game as well okay. on my channel. I'm sure I'll let's play it. Let's play the snaps out of it too. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for, for your time and uh, good luck to thank you, you. And, on your future I'll, projects. I'll hold you there. Yeah. Hit, me up, hit me up when we announce the next thing. Cause it's, com yeah. it's coming. Cool. It's coming, man. You're well, going you to be ready for this you, nonsense. You, ha of you have you have my email, and I mean, once I see the announcement, I'll I'll email you as well too. So oh yeah, happy to do that. Happy to talk to you again. Thanks, guys. That's All exciting. Right. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you for watching, and until next time, love yourselves and love each other. Bye bye. And love Pac Man. And love Pac Man. It's, <laughs> it's obligatory. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, love Pac Man. <laughs> All right. <laughs>